Today I'm going to read from Calculus Made Easy, being a very simplest introduction to those beautiful methods of reckoning which are generally called by the terrifying names of the differential calculus and the integral calculus by FRS, second edition, enlarged. So this publication came in several editions between, as we can see, 1910 and 1914. This is one of those sort of unusual books, as you can see. What one fool can do, another can. So this author turns out to be one of those math book authors who feels the need to put his own sense of humor into the work. And in this case, I think it really does work. Preface to the second edition. The surprising success of this work has led to the, the author to add a considerable number of worked examples and exercises. Advantage has also been taken to enlarge certain parts where experience showed that further explanations would be useful. The author acknowledges with gratitude many valuable suggestions and letters received from teachers, students, and critics. October 1914. Contents, prologue. Look at this, number one, to deliver you from the preliminary terrors on different degrees of smallness, on relative growings, simplest cases. Next stage, what to do with constants, sums, differences, products, and quotients, successive differentiation, when time varies. Introducing a useful dodge. So this is the part that really stands out that I very much noticed when I first encountered this book. Prologue. Considering how many fools can calculate, it is surprising that it should be thought either a difficult or a tedious task for any other fool to learn how to master the same tricks. Some calculus tricks are quite easy. Some are enormously difficult. The fools who write the textbooks of advanced mathematics, and they are mostly clever fools, seldom take the trouble to show you how easy the easy calculations are. On the contrary, they seem to desire to impress you with their tremendous cleverness by going about it in the most difficult way. Being myself a remarkably stupid fellow, I have had to unteach myself the difficulties and now beg to present to my fellow fools the parts that are not hard. Master these thoroughly and the rest will follow. What one fool can do, another can. What a marvelous prologue. He's trying to obviously give people the sort of disenchant the idea of calculus. This idea that we have now that calculus should be a high school course isn't really all that old, even people that I've met born in the 40s didn't really have calculus in high school. Typically what we would have is algebra, maybe algebra two, a geometry class, often trigonometry. So here we go, chapter one, to deliver you from the preliminary terrors. The preliminary terror, which chokes off most fifth form boys from even attempting to learn how to calculate, can be abolished once for all by simply stating what is the meaning in common sense terms of the two principal symbols that are used in calculating. These dreadful symbols are, one, D, which merely means a little bit of. 
Thus, dx means a little bit of x, or du means a little bit of u. Ordinary mathematicians think it more polite to say an element of instead of a little bit of, just as you please. But you will find that these little bits or elements may be considered to be indefinitely small. The integral sign, which is merely along S and may be called, if you like, the sum of. Thus, the sum of dx means the sum of all the little bits of x. The sum of dt means the sum of all the little bits of t. Ordinary mathematicians call this symbol the integral of. Now, any fool can see that if x is considered as made up of a lot of little bits, each of which is called dx, if you add them all up together, you get the sum of all the dx's, which is the same thing as the whole of x. The word integral simply means the whole. If you think of the duration of time for one hour, you may, if you like, think of it as cut up into 3,600 little bits called seconds. The whole of the 3,600 little bits added up together make one hour. When you see an expression that begins with this terrifying symbol, you will henceforth know that it is put there merely to give you instructions, that you are now to perform the operation, if you can, of totaling up all the little bits that are indicated by the symbols that's fo that follow. That's all. So I like the sense of humor, the sort of wit, and easy kind of style this book has. The next piece here, chapter two, on different degrees of smallness. I'll read a little bit about this here. On different degrees of smallness, smallness. We shall find that in our processes of calculation, we have to deal with small quantities of various degrees of smallness. We shall have also to learn under what circumstances we may consider small quantities to be so minute that we may omit them from consideration. Everything depends upon relative minuteness. Before we fix any rules, let us think of some familiar cases. There are 60 minutes in the hour, 24 hours in the day, seven days in the week. There are therefore 1,440 minutes in the day and 10,080 minutes in the week. Obviously, one minute is a very small quantity of time compared with a whole week. Indeed, our forefathers considered it small as compared with an hour and called it one minute, meaning a minute, fra um, a minute fraction, namely one sixtieth of an hour. When they came to require still smaller subdivisions of time, they divided each minute into sixty still smaller parts, which, in Queen Elizabeth's days, they called second minutes, i.e., small quantities of the second order of minuteness. Nowadays, we call these small quantities of the second order of smallness seconds but few people know why they are so called. Now, if one minute is so small as compared with a whole day, think how much smaller by comparison is one second. Again, think of a farthing as compared with a sovereign. It is barely worth more than one one thousandth part. A farthing, more or less, is of precious little importance compared with a sovereign. It may certainly be regarded as a small quantity. But compare a farthing with a thousand pounds. Relatively to this greater sum, the farthing is of no more importance than one one thousandth of a farthing would be to a sovereign. Even a golden sovereign is relatively a negligible quantity in the wealth of a millionaire. So I'm reaching the end of my recording time here, so I will continue this later.